Hello and welcome to another episode of Script Apart. My name's Al Horner, and this is a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies and TV shows. Each week, an acclaimed screenwriter joins us to revisit their first draft of what became a beloved film or series. This week, uno, dos, tres, toco la pared. In 2007, there was no more chilling a sentence for moviegoers, as the gripping ghost story El Orfanto swept cinemas worldwide. The Orphanage, as it was known in the UK and America, was an instant classic tale of grief and obsession that remains a cherished piece of horror cinema today. It followed a mother called Laura, who must grapple with the mystery of what happened to her adopted son after he disappears in the former orphanage that she and her husband have bought and made home. The film was directed by Jay Bayona, produced by Guillermo del Toro, and written by our guest today, the talented Sergio G. Sanchez. Sergio, as you'll discover in this episode, reached deep into his own childhood to write this moving tale, interweaving stories like Peter Pan into a script that confronted his own experience of severe illness as a child. He told me all about his fight to keep the movie a gothic slow burn, resisting studio pressure to turn the film into a carnival of jump scares. We get into all the hidden meanings and messages of the movie, including the mythology of the orphanage itself that formed a big part of his original script. Also discussed are the movie's many misdirects that craftily keep viewers guessing till its dying embers, and the film's final devastating reveal and bittersweet closing moments, which we break down in detail. As a massive fan of this movie, it was a pleasure chatting with Sergio to mark the film's 15th anniversary. Not sure where the time's gone there. Hopefully I don't sound too different today to usual episodes. I'm currently in Los Angeles for a few months with some writing projects, so my setup is a little bit different to usual. Fingers crossed it isn't too noticeable. Just quickly before we jump in, a huge thank you as ever to our Patreon supporters who help make this show possible. If you like what we do and want to help the show continue to grow, you can join us by visiting patreon.com forward slash script apart, where you'll receive ad-free episodes and all sorts of exclusive bonus content. That address again, in case you're interested, it's patreon.com forward slash script apart. We really appreciate your support. Okay, let's dive in then, shall we? This is the great Sergio G. Sanchez discussing the first draft secrets of one of my favorite modern horrors, The Orphanage. Thank you so much for tuning in. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Hey, Sergio, great to meet you. Welcome to Script Apart. How are you doing today? I'm very good. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. We're actually talking 15 years, almost to the day of the premiere of The Orphanage at Cannes in 2007. It's taken 15 years, but my heart rate has just about returned to normal after my first time watching the movie. <laughs> um, it's it's such a beloved story that film fans continue to reach for and, and return to again and again. What do you think spoke to people about, about The Orphanage, Sergio? I don't know. I was the first one who was surprised when we saw the reception. Uh, that, that, that one time at Cannes, we were at the Critics Week. And I remember actually, I, I walked into, into the theater and was the first 30 minutes of it. And the audience was completely into it. And then I had to go out because I had to send some pictures for a Spanish newspaper. And then when I came back, it was right when going to the basement. And suddenly I walked into the theater and everyone was laughing hysterically. And I was like, oh, my God, what happened here? And, uh, and then we learned <laughs> that apparently a woman screamed with one of the scare jumps. And, so, and she screamed so loud that everyone was laughing. But for a moment, I panicked and I, I thought we had lost them. And, and we were so surprised <laughs> that we got such a warm reaction. And I think it had to do, everyone was very emotional at the end of the film. So I guess uh, it's the combination of suspense and the puzzle, you know, it's like your mind is occupied trying to solve this puzzle. And then suddenly it hits you emotionally. And I think that's what people weren't expecting. And maybe that's probably why it, why it connected so much with audiences. And also, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a mother and son story and everyone can relate to that, I think. Sergio, there's a tradition within ghost stories in, in both literature and film of ghosts being a manifestation of some piece of the past or memory that can no longer stay suppressed. I was wondering whether writing the film, writing this first draft in what I believe was either 96 or 97, whether whether your work there echoed that description at all. Like, I know that you experienced illness as a child and you were in and out of hospital 
contemplating what it would mean to die, contemplating what it would mean for your parents to die and for you to become an orphan. How much of your past and how much of, of that experience was coming to the fore as you began to weave this story? Since it was my first script, you always tend to, or I guess uh, at least some of my teachers told me, try to make something personal, even if, if I have had no encounters with ghosts. <laughs> so, but there's something about my fear of death when I was a kid. Yeah, because I was, I was sick very often and in and out of hospitals, as you said. And, uh, and also my, my parents were very old and so are my brothers and sisters much, much older than me. And I was obsessed with this idea of, of uh, separation of either me dying or having to see, watch my whole family go away. Um, I had this strange fear also. I, now I remember when I was a kid, I, I had this obsession. Somehow it got in my mind that I was not really a kid, but I was an old man remembering his childhood and so I had this pathological fear of mirrors. I, I, I avoided mirrors at all costs because I was convinced that uh, uh, sooner or later I would see my own reflection and I would be, I would see that old man remembering his childhood and then sort of like <laughs> my childhood would end immediately. Uh, that was for another movie for Marabone. <laughs> and... Uh, so yeah, the, the fear of death was very present in, in my childhood, and, and, and along with all this, with these invisible friends that I had that are in the movie, but also I was uh, I was obsessed with horror films. My brothers and sisters were watching horror movies all the time, and my mom would not allow me to see them. So I would just stay in my room, listening to all that creepy, scary music coming down the hallway, and hearing the screams, and imagining what was on that uh, on, on that on that TV screen and somehow I started sort of like building up my own horror movies in my head that had nothing to do with the movies that were they were watching <laughs> uh, so that was a big influence and uh, had that had a big impact on me and also uh, this book that I read when I was I, I think 12 uh, The Turn of the Screw by Henry James and uh, I did not understand a thing the first time I read that book <laughs> and I kept coming back to it year after year and each time I read it I, I interpreted something different because it's never quite clear in the book. It's, it's open to your own interpretation if the ghosts are real or if it's all happening in, in the nurse's head. So I, that, that's what I sort of trying to, was trying to do when I started doing the orphanage. I wanted to sort of like put my own fears and obsessions as a kid and try to make an, an ambiguous movie uh, where you were not 100% sure if you were watching some kind of supernatural descent into madness. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I mean, you've talked in the past about there being two possible readings of this, or at least that being the intention. You could read it as the psychological decaying process of Laura, who is gradually losing her mind. Or you could, uh, you could believe that there's nothing otherworldly going on. Both things kind of concurrently are plausible. What is so exciting to you about kind of walking that particular tightrope? You've you've done it again elsewhere in your career. Is there something that um, beyond your love for for that early literature you were reading when you were twelve? Is there something about that particular story type that you love? Well, I guess that's the kind of film I I I feel more attracted to. So when you write or when you make a film, you you sort of make the movie you would like to watch on the screen and. I think there's something about walking that line where you, that uh, invites the audience to have a more active participation in the story. You're trying to put the pieces together. You're just not watching one action scene after another. It's like you have to sort of have to sort out what is it they're telling you and how much you can trust your narrator. Are they telling me all the truth? What uh, and, and suddenly when you take chunks chunks of the story away deliberately, you're forcing the audience to to question what they're watching, you know, and I think that's that's a more interesting that makes for a more interesting experience, as long as you have uh, uh, sufficient emotional engagement with the characters, which is the other key, I guess, to horror. You have to really care about the characters, otherwise, mm, <laughs> the movie <laughs> dies very soon. Now, well, that's interesting you should bring that up because that was one of the big kind of um, points of resistance, I suppose, when you had, you had written your first draft and was shopping it around. Like yeah. um, from the sounds of it, you had a lot of knockbacks and the refrain you kept on coming up against was this is a mixture of drama and horror and those two elements 
they don't mix you don't have a main villain you have two endings mm -hmm. um could you t could you talk to me about like uh yeah this sort of decision the intention to kind of blend drama and horror and give like a really rich emotional resonance to what was happening as well as scares to be honest i wasn't really aware that i was breaking any any rules i i just felt that those two forces sort of helped each other if if you're invested emotionally with a main character you you're going to care about everything that happens so when this is, so when the horror bits come up uh your implication and the tension is going to go through the roof uh, whereas when you watch another type of horror movie that can be lots of fun but it's just about okay who's going to die next and how and uh but you don't really care it's it's just part of the fun and and see the blood and the and the gore and everything um it's it makes for a different kind of experience and i and i thought um there's always something in horror playing on, on a very elemental level you of course you care for the characters but i thought what if we take it one step further and make this a really powerful drama i mean the, make the stakes higher and and talk about things that people that you don't usually see in in horror movies like a mother fearing the uh, losing her child to a disease in this case i mean simon's was hiv positive and i, I had never seen that in a, in a horror movie uh in a movie period i hadn't seen anyone deal yeah. with children with uh and and also her own issues with being an orphan and uh, and so I just thought that just raising the emotional stakes made the horror more effective and also the other way around. So I was very surprised when 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 I got all those reactions and and I, I didn't understand what was it about horror and drama that could not mix. And I thought it was that's what made the the movie special. But yeah. somehow, I, I guess producers were not excited about the prospect of a horror film ending up in a big, tearful, emotional scene <laughs> instead of a, a horrific uh, climax. Did you experiment with making those concessions? Are there drafts in existence where you did try and give the film a villain or you did try and kind of make it more pronounced as a horror movie? Or did you always know that like this this blend, this vision that I have for this story, I've got to, I've got to stay true to it because it's going to be something special? Um, again, it's just, I, I think when you're writing, you just have to trust your instincts and your own worldview. Um, uh, they, yeah, they ask many times, like, we need a stronger villain. You need to either make a Benigna or Tomas really evil. And I thought, no, that's not it. I think it's, it, I mean, it's, it's part of it. For me, there's something really important in storytelling, which is point of view. I mean, and, and, and. And they're at the heart of drama is always getting the audience to see the world through somebody else's eyes and and have them identify with someone who you would think is the, the complete opposite of what you are who you are. So I, I think it would it was interesting to see that okay, there's a there's a ghost of this evil kid, supposedly evil kid who's not evil at all. Actually, he's a victim of the of Laura's beloved friends, but it, at the same time, it's all kind of innocent, and they're all they're all victims in the story. There's no true villain, and sometimes I think, in 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 in, in real life, people who behave badly is because they've suffered so much. And uh, so I think you always have to try to show both sides. And uh, and I resisted uh, writing a villain in, into the story, and actually it was. Uh, it was funny because I, I we had the same thing on on our next movie with the impossible. It's like I have a bad guy because it was like oh that's that's tsunami is not enough. It's like you <laughs> really need bad people hurting each other. It's like and I sort of avoided the the villain and up until Marabon. So, <laughs> but but yeah, I, I tried to resist it and I, I again I thought I mean in, when you work in in, in horror and and something like a haunted house movie like this uh there's so many tropes and you sort of play around with some of them and you try to avoid others and then i think that's one of the things that made the movie special there's no villain in this horror story and the emotion is on the same level as the horror and the film invokes a lot of fairy tales like there's a few hansel and gretel moments but Peter Pan is the most pronounced. Like, there's even a line at the end of the movie likening Lara to Wendy, but all grown up. 
Was there something tragic or dark about Peter Pan beneath the, ch the cheery surface of that story that you wanted to tap into here? What about that story felt relevant to the tale that you were telling with the orphanage? Yeah, again, that's uh, again something that's linked to my, my childhood. There's two books that horrified me as a kid that my mom used to read to me. One was The Little Prince, <laughs> which is... a and I have no idea why that book is 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 given to children. <laughs> I think it's like the the loneliest story ever. It's it's horrible. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then Peter Pan, and because it's at the heart of. The, I mean, the, the the main chunk of Peter Pan is a wonderful adventure story, but the first two chapters and the final one are so brutal. And in the first one, is as there are all these descriptions about how this mother tries to keep her children being children forever. And there's that, there's a very eerie description on, on how, the, there's a moment when they tell that when the children go to sleep, she tries to, she takes the thoughts out of their brains and tries to clean them up and <laughs> put some order. And it's like, whoa, what does this mean exactly? So there's that, like, that, that moment of separation <laughs> where, kids and parents sort of like go in different directions and it's inevitable and it has to happen but it's it's a, it's it's such a strong frontier that really that really impressed me and, and it stuck with me and i i thought it would be interesting to sort of tell the story of peter pan from the point of view of that mother who is left alone in the house while their kids go to oh, never neverland and um, and also I think there's something that attracts me a lot in storytelling, which is uh, sort of exploring frontiers. And it's like, what is the frontier between childhood and adulthood? Because said, there, are, Laura behaves like a child. It's it's like she hasn't grown up completely. She's she's got this deep emotional attachment to her past that sort of doesn't allow her to become. Uh, uh, a grown up so and uh, there's that limit childhood and adulthood there's reality and fantasy and that's where the fairy tales play so you see simon reading peter pan at the beginning of the story and asking her what 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 happened why did she grow up and then we pick that up again at the end just kind of uh, uh go into the story and, and show the other side and um there's also so many moments, I mean, in order to recover her kid, she has to play as if she was a child again. And uh, I think that's probably the most uh, perverse moment in the story when she she goes down in the basement and she's so lost in the game that she's actually, she's able to get in touch with the ghost of her son who is in the house with the ghosts of the other children. But when she, con she tries to convince that kid that the ghost aren't real what happens is Simon vanishes and then she's only what she finds is the corpse and she's the real side so there's also there's I'm always playing with that frontier what's where's reality and where's fantasy and what's the frontier between the two of them and where do people find themselves comfortable because Laura once is more comfortable in the fantasy world and Carlos her husband is uh, just always trying to pull her back into reality now when when the medium comes home and she's like what are we playing at here i mean these people are never mentioned in the possibility of bringing simon back if they can talk to the dead um let's move, get out of here and <laughs> and if simon's alive they're not going to help us so there's that tension all, all the time sorry i yes. i get along from your original <laughs> <laughs> no it's all great it's fascinating it, it's interesting like uh you know i had read that the close encounters of the third kind was a big yeah. influence for you with this film and th the first couple of times that i watched it i i wasn't sure where that comparison lay and and it was only really kind of on on the most recent rewatch that i realized that it the pacing of it and uh the way that kind of like you meter out the glimpses of this kind of supernatural other, th these supernatural happenings. It it's actually quite similar. And um, the way that in Close Encounters, sort of this, this alien, in a literal sense in that film, alien kind of uh, presence divides people. Some people want to believe, other people, like the husband in the orphanage, are sort of just not inclined to sort of get on board with the idea of there being more beyond kind of the material world that they're used to. 
you know, there's there's a comparison, and uh, yeah, it was interesting to kind of see it through through that lens this time. Um, can you talk to me about yeah Spielberg, his influence, and and Close Encounters in particular, how you harnessed some of the ideas in that film and kind of applied them here? Well, um, the main thing for me is it is about I, I think. Close Encounters is one of my favorite films of all time, and I think it's a monumental work. And and also, it's uh, especially that last act and the third act, or whatever you want to call it. That that that, yeah. that whole final scene is it's so abstract and uh, open to interpretation. Interpretation, and and I mean Spielberg is such a brilliant filmmaker and John Williams score is so wonderful and poetic that you go along and of course you want Richard Dreyfuss to get on that mothership and go God knows where <laughs> and abandon his family. <laughs> it was like, so if, to me, it was like, yeah, I, I wanted to sort of make that same journey where you end up identifying with someone who has this deep longing for something he can't even articulate. And it's there in his thoughts and it comes up in his dreams and he's assaulted by images that he cannot comprehend, but he knows there's something waiting for him. So in, in, a, in a way, that's the same thing that happens with Laura. She's obsessed with going back to the home where she grew up and open, not an orphanage, but, but sort of a, a residence for disabled kids so that she can get in touch again with that only moment of happiness that she had when she, when she grew up. And, and it's an obsession that uh, she can't escape. And so I, I think that's where the, the two movies, uh, where, where that served as, a, as an inspiration. And also uh, uh, there's something else. I mean, when I was writing the script, I, it was the first time I, I wrote something. And of course I had learned all about structure and acts and things. And then you you sort of like, put what you've learned in school against the test of the films you love and you go like, yeah. it doesn't work like that. Exactly. It's like, the, <laughs> like the, you have to break some rules or you have to sort of like grab the audience from the heart. And then structure is not that important when, when the emotional engagement is there. So one thing I did is sort of like, I remember I watched close encounters and I sort of like minute by minute, I went like, okay, this happens here. This happens here. We need a big thing on on minute ten, and I sort of built a template that I try to reproduce. <laughs> so uh, actually, in the first draft of of the orphan, it didn't start as it starts in the movie. There were like three different scenes with three different characters uh, discovering something. Um, just like just like it did in, in Close Encounters. That was just for the first rap. You need to get the first rap there. And, and then once you know the story, you can go on and, and, and build your own. But I remember that that movie was like, um, I almost sort of used it as a template. And it's funny because of all the movies that The Orphanage has been compared to, no one, no one points at Close Encounters. So, <laughs> so I guess I was, it, was a, it was a good process because I, I managed to lose everything of my model in the way. <laughs> Speaking of that first draft, like, is it fair to say that that first draft was kind of less focused on Lara and more focused on the sort of, or more attention certainly was given to the wider mythology of the story, who the kids were, how they died and so on and so forth. I'd love to hear about some of the other differences between that first draft and the finished movie as, yeah, in addition to the to the beginning, to the intro scene that you just described, it, it sounds like there were quite a few evolutions, especially once J.A. came on board. Yeah, there were more things. Um uh the kids came it's like uh, i I, re I think i remember it, it it was so such a long time ago that i'm not 100 percent <laughs> sure that what i'm going to tell you now is 100 percent truth but uh i think there were other kids uh like simon who had been given to other families who had been raised in an orphanage where they were sort of like uh, experimenting with the kids it was some kind of cult that kept the children isolated from each other. Uh, 
because they wanted to see if if the kids were isolated and they were not taught a language they would develop what they would call the language of god and somehow they would create their their own language to communicate with each other and what happened is that those kids sort of like were able to communicate mentally and create some kind of supernatural bond where death could not bring them apart so if i remember correctly uh on the first draft those the ghost children were not uh laura's friends but they were the brothers and sisters who simon had been separated from and and so there were other parents with similar stories that's where the close encounter things come comes up it's like parents with children with strange things happening and goes to play and uh but that was like the very very first draft i think when when juan Anton, when bayona read it we had already moved from from that and uh, and the thing is when when he got to him it's like okay let's focus on laura it, and whatever happened in the past has to be linked to to the main character it cannot be something that comes from the outside so what was it about that the the, the sort of like cult element of it that you were bumping up against and wasn't quite working that made you streamline it into more of a, a sort of character piece story well it, i i think it's just part of the um, you never know where, where the first spark of an idea comes from and and i i guess i was intrigued with this possibility of again it's it's when you think about it, it's it's the same route. I mean, it's what I did is what I ended up giving to Laura and her friends, that link, that bond that could not be broken. Uh, it was the, what interested me about the story was th- this kids, these kids who were orphans and had a huge emotional bond suddenly are separated and some of them died. But I needed an excuse to find why would they keep coming to each other as ghosts? So that's where the whole cult thing came up and then we abandoned that because we 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 realized that there was a way of bringing that what what was interesting of that aspect bringing it to the story through Laura and forgetting about everything else and did that first draft or like well any of those early drafts did any of them grapple more with the history of Spain Sergio because well there's been quite a lot of interpretations of the film over the years as in some way a comment on the fall of Franco, in some way kind of parallel to those events, as having something to say about Spanish history. Like, yeah, I'd be curious to hear whether that was ever a pronounced part of this movie, and indeed whether you kind of see that as being part of the the makeup of of the orphanage. Um, It's it's funny because some people uh, from outside Spain read that into the film it was never <laughs> our intention that's interesting and almost to a point where uh, i mean when we were growing up in spain it was like when we were kids during the, the late 70s and 80s every film that was made in spain was about the civil war which ended up creating some kind of i mean it was it became like tiresome for this new generation of filmmakers. Like we need to make other types of stories. And sort of we, I mean, consciously we try to get away from that narrative as much as possible because there was, there were far too many films dealing with that already. But maybe it's one of those things that it's, it's just engraved in our DNA. It's, it's a, it was kind of recent. It was a, only 40 years before that we were born and that this happened. And maybe there's something in there that unconsciously <laughs> floats into the story, but it was never intentional. So J.A. has spoken about having to cut some things from the script because even after Guillermo came on board as a producer and the, and the budget doubled, basically, it was still a relatively low bro- budget production. So there were things that still needed to be cut. Could you tell me about some of those elements that sort of had to come out of the script for you know budgetary reasons? Yeah, they were just like big horror set pieces, and um, like uh, another of uh, a film I I showed to Bayona also when we were doing this was uh, the Haunting of the House and uh, the Innocents, and we loved that those elaborate long horror set pieces in the house, and there were things like that, and and I guess in a way it was what happened was similar to what happened in, in Jaws, where it's like uh, the shark didn't work, so they had to come up with more creative ways uh, to frighten the audience. Um, 
we wanted to make the big special, a big special effects movie with ghosts and things that happen and things moving around. And it's like, okay, we don't have the money for that. So we're going to have to write a scene with a medium coming into a house and she's just going to tell you what she sees, but you're not going to see it. And, uh, and that's where it's like, what, what if it happens at night and we do, and, and it, it's all seen through night vision cameras. And then you have that green screen, creepy <laughs> texture. That, and then you add Geraldine Chaplin to the cocktail and it, and it works. <laughs> but yeah, so it's it basically, we wanted to have more spectacular set pieces. It wasn't, and, and since we didn't have the money, we had to sort of like you know, work out ways to scare the audience without any money. Like for example, that one, two, three, knock on the wall uh, scene, which is my favorite moment in the film. Uh, and uh, and actually, I remember that that day. It's like uh, Bayona had storyboarded that sequence and had like two hundred shots or something. It's like it was a very long moment, and we didn't have the time. We didn't have the. And he he kept hoping that they would give us two extra days to shoot this scene the way he wanted to do it. And and we were on set. Like I don't know how I'm going to do this because he was so in love with with that scene, and, and I told him, what if you do it in just one shot and you just keep panning back and forth uh, from her to the kids and there's nothing there. And then one door, the door is open and there's just one kid. And it was so beautiful. <laughs> it's one of those good things, but sometimes it's, it's, it's good that you don't have all the money you want because probably I doubt that, that scene could have been any better than as it is right now. Yeah, I guess creative limitations sometimes bring about, uh, you know, the best results. But before we get to that moment, Sergio, the setup in this first act is extraordinary. You introduce the beach caves nearby as one plausible explanation for what might have happened to Simon when he later goes missing. You also introduce the character Benigna, I really hope I'm pronouncing that right, with a spooky succession of scenes kind of giving the impression that she might be an antagonist, someone who perhaps has even kidnapped Simon. All of these things are such good red herrings, such good misdirects that kind of keep us as an audience constantly guessing and uh yeah as as we snake through the film we're we're wondering if uh you know what's really happened here is something not supernatural at all and maybe it has like a perfectly uh you know grounded uh explanation so yeah i'd love to hear about how you set up all these things how you layered them all into the plot and i'd especially love to hear about benigna kind of how that character came to be and what her function in this story is um she came on pretty early i thought um and again it was i, I remember when when we discussed this we thought it i i remember telling by honest like i imagine her as some kind of one of the neighbors of rosemary and rosemary's baby you know it was like how roman polanski is very uh sharp at casting characters with i mean you see one face and you know the character <laughs> and we needed to find someone very special for benigna it's like the first moment you she opens the door and she's her there under the rain with a plastic bag on her head it's like what is wrong here <laughs> and uh so <laughs> the character came very early and because also i think i mean we I tried when when I write it, and 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 it's funny because when the movie screened, there were so many details that people didn't catch on a first uh, watch. That if you watch the film more than once, then it becomes something else, and you realize that everything has a reason. It's like why was Benigna there to begin with, and then you know that oh, there's the the bodies of the kids are still hidden somewhere in that house and she needed to since the house had been abandoned for 40 years now she needs to 30 sorry <laughs> she needs to get those get those bodies out and there's many bits of the story that are never explained and we try to uh, have the audience filling the blanks so that also because I I think movies should be watched more than once and it's good that you save something for that second viewing. Uh, so once you know everything, the movie changes a little bit and then then you can see why Benigna was there and, and all the um, some other little pieces that perhaps you don't pick up on the first time. Uh, they pop out clearly on, on later viewings. That's really interesting. It, is there a process that you have for kind of uh, going back into the sort of first act and second act and sort of 
planting those seeds that you know are going to bloom later because the one that really got me on my most recent rewatch was when the medium uh is explaining that or or suggesting to lara that perhaps simon uh was able to speak to the ghosts because he himself was was close to death it was only really on this rewatch that i realized that Lara can see the ghosts towards the end of this film because she herself unknowingly was was getting yeah. close to death. Absolutely. And thank you so the, much. The layering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, happy to. But yeah, what, what's the process for, for kind of adding those things in? Um, the process, though. Um, I, I I always keep a notebook when, when I'm starting a, a screenplay. The first thing I, I do is once I know what the story is about and how it's going to end for me it's 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 absolutely necessary knowing how the movie is going to end and then you go backwards and so i always i fill up a wall with three by five cards with all the scenes and i move them around until i have some sort of structure and and then i have this little notebook um and i always I do it in handwriting because I, I figure it's, I, I don't know why, but if you do it on a computer, uh, it doesn't stick to your brain. <laughs> but if you <laughs> yeah. write it down, physically write it down, then it, it sort of like stays there. Uh, I do all the, all the planting and saying, I mean, saying, okay, I'm going to plant this here. I'm going to pick it up there. Um, and there's lots of stuff. Like, for example, when Simon gets lost, Carlos gives Lara uh, his medal of St. Anthony saying, mm, you keep this. Um, uh, St. Anthony is the, uh, in, in Catholic tradition, is uh, the saint that you pray to when you have lost something. Uh, yeah. and, so, and he, he gives it her the medal and says, uh, I, I want you to keep this, but it's, it's not a gift. It's, you're going, you'll give it back to me when you find Simon again. And, uh, and that's also one of the twisted things in, in, the, in the, because actually by the end of the film, she breaks that chain and she throws that metal on the floor because she's like, okay, all faith, I abandon all faith. It's like, why have you sort of like left me alone? Why, why do I have to experience something this horrible? So she is denying any kind of faith and then when carlos comes home and finds that medal interprets that as a sign of okay she found him and he is convinced for the first time that there might be some kind of supernatural force at work in the house and so i i love playing those games and also i love trying to give them ambiguous meanings i i told you before about this how she she when she's trying to convince her own kid that there are no ghosts and thus she loses him. And, and then at the end, it's like all, all the big, the theme in the story is, uh, is articulated by the character that Geraldine Chapman plays, Aurora. when she says, seeing is not believing, it's the other way around. And so mm. it's like, it's what you want to believe uh, will happen. So um, at the beginning of the movie, um, Carlos wants her to be calm, uh, but he does, he himself does not believe in any kind of, and any of, of the stories that he, their kid was telling them. And in the end, he needs to believe. So suddenly the wind moves the door and it's like, okay, this is a sign that they're here. Uh, <laughs> is it? I don't know. It's, it's open entirely. In the, I like it to be open to the audience interpretation. And that's mm-hmm. the reason why I was, I think the script was much more open uh, than the film is. I got, I, I had many discussions with Bayona. For example, the first time you see Tomas, um, uh, Laura is looking, is, is, is looking for her son and she moves away and Tomas is right behind her. The audience is seeing something that she, something she can't see. And that to me was a big problem <laughs> because I told her, I was like, no, you're cheating. <laughs> it's like everything has to be through her eyes. And it, she, she, you need to wait till up, up until she's up on that hallway and, and she sees the kid for the first time, who's actually her son wearing a mask, not a ghost, because at that moment, yeah. not able to see the ghosts. And uh, so, so we had these kinds of discussions and then there's lots of shots and throughout the film where uh, a swing will move 
outside the house or a door slams on its own. I was like, what the hell is this? No, don't do this. <laughs> uh, and then when I saw the movie in the movie theater with the audience and they were like on the edge of their seats with all these little touches, like, okay, go ahead. So it's a ghost story now. <laughs> it's completely a ghost story, but there were there were things in there designed so that it, it could could be or could be something else. And speaking of design, the, the sort of mask of Tomas, like it's so distinctive. And although the film doesn't have a villain, it doesn't have a monster, that is that kind of iconic look that people could almost dress up for, you know, you know for Halloween in. W was that on the page or where did the sort of design of Tomas and that mask come about? It wasn't the page. Uh, what wasn't the page is that he, he wore uh, uh, a little sack with a, with a hole over his eye. And uh, I'm going to be completely honest with you. It, it, that comes from The Elephant Man, which is a film oh. that terrified me as a kid. <laughs> and I just remember him when you see him around the, on the first scenes with the big cloak and that thing on his head and sort of indicating some kind of deformity, deformity underneath. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, this, this is what, uh, how I imagined this kid. And, and then he thought, uh, and this was uh, Bayona's idea, that the mask should have it it would it should be something that a mother would have made with love trying to make him look cheerful but um something going awfully wrong in the process <laughs> <laughs> and just making yeah. it far more spookier than it but then what's you under can say the that mask? again <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, he made Bayona made some drawings, and then David and Monse, uh, the special effects, the, the the makeup artist who made uh, some Tomas face, uh, who had just worked with Guillermo the year before, and they they actually got an got an Oscar when, while we were making the movie, yeah. and so it's it's uh, it's actually Bayona and, and David and Monse's uh, merit to have that design i only on the page the only thing it was it was a kid with a with a sack in his over his head <laughs> there's a scene about 20 minutes in which um uh, you know it's funny we talked earlier about like you know how you can go back to this film and sort of see it in a different light each time it was really only on this this kind of revisit of of the orphanage that i realized how pivotal this scene is and how much like heavy lifting is being done there's a scene about 20 minutes in in which um uh, Simon and Laura go on this kind of treasure hunt around the house mm -hmm. and it, it's doing it's, it's accomplishing three things and if you take out this scene then the rest of the movie doesn't quite like spark I don't think not only does this sequence give the audience a sense of Laura's love for Simon you see their relationship and her playfulness with him not only does it foreshadow the game towards the end of the film that mm -hmm. Laura's going to play with the ghosts but also it gives us a geography of the house that's really important. And it makes the sort of the, the space of the orphanage of that house feel we know it as, a, as an audience before we're kind of led on that chase later on. Mm -hmm. Where did this idea come from? And was, was that a tough scene to crack? Because it's, as I say, it it's so pivotal to the rest of the film without you really well, even realizing it. Um, it was very easy because that was the kind of game I, I played with uh, with my mom. Apparently, with, <laughs> oh, really? with my invisible friends, I would I would just leave, leave tracks. I would steal something from her and put something else in its place, so that she would have to go somewhere else. And 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 I kept telling her, no, it wasn't me. It was Watson and Pepe. And so <laughs> it's something I did as a kid. Um, thankfully, I, I didn't end up dead in the basement in the process. <laughs> but that that was the game. That wasn't the story to begin with. And then. I, again, I, I decided that that should be one of those things where you, you, you plant in the first act and you recover in the third act in a, in a different way. I always like these games of mirrors, of, of mirroring, doing you do it one way and then it has a, a creepy reenactment somewhere later on. And uh, so, yeah, that was part of it. And, and it's, it's actually one of those things that came pretty naturally we only once we knew what the house would be like and that i mean we changed the clues and where they went and things like that but uh, we just needed to know because we weren't certain what kind of house we would get uh which was a combination of a real house and a and a, and a set built on a built on a sound stage so when we knew all the whole geography we rewrote it so that 
you could know that get to know the house before she has to explore her, the house on her own. That's interesting. And okay, we should get to it. The moment that is the 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 biggest jump scare I've I've seen in a cinema, perhaps, perhaps ever, definitely in the top five. The 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 death, <laughs> the death sequence involving the truck. Um, that <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> floored me when I watched this in 2007. I read that um, this moment was almost a, a bit of a kind of fuck you to the studios who were leaning on you to kind of like have an antagonist. I think I read Bayona uh, saying something about how like he loved the idea of like, okay, let's let's lean into the idea that she may be the antagonist and that, then let's kill her off in the second act. And it, yeah. from that point, it's like all bets are off. C- can you tell me about sort of the development of that scene? Um, yeah, we wanted to have something, uh, it's, it, it's, it's not like psycho because it's not the, the, the main character, but we wanted to have something very shocking happen that sort of leaves the audience not knowing where the hell the story is going to go from there. Cause, cause you've made the introduction of this character sort of like, yeah, making the people believe that she's going to be the main villain and suddenly she reappears and it's like, okay, now she's going to give me some kind of clue and boom, <laughs> <laughs> out with the character. <laughs> in the, and it actually has, that scene has two functions. One is to leave the audience without any kind of expectations. Like, I don't know where the movie's going to go from here. And, uh, and the other one is... Mm, what Bayona and I called this like random acts of terrorism. Because <laughs> it's like you, when something like, at that moment, nothing has happened before in the story to sort of, to prepare you for something as shocking and gory. And there will never be another one in, 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 in the movie. Uh, that's why I, I think breaking the rules is just as important as knowing them. Um, so you see that that comes out of nowhere and suddenly because then it's uh, after that there's a very quiet stretch in the movie where nothing happens and it's all about Laura going to a grieving group and trying to find answers and she being alone and missing her kid but but you you put that bomb in there and suddenly the audience is going to wait is going to worry that a bump can go off any, at any time. So you have people sort of like anticipating something and nothing is going to, I mean, there's like that moment and maybe two more. Um, I, I think that the big horror set piece is that one, two, three, knock on the wall scene, which is very quiet and slow. And there's just a couple of, scare shots here and there. And that's actually something that Guillermo told us because when um, when we showed him the script right before we, we went to work, we, we told him it's like, some people are worried that this is a strange mix of horror and drama and they're not sure that this is gonna work. And he told us, give them two big shocks and it will be a horror movie. That's it, that's all, that's all the audience needs. So, so we try to make those moments count. <laughs> Well, what's so great about what unfolds from that moment on is, you know, so much horror you watch is scary things happening to a character. And what's yeah. quite, uh, what, what's brilliant about, about this second act going into the third act is how active Laura is. You know, she decides to hire the medium. She's trying to find out what happened to Simon. She's, uh, we, ha- we have, of course, that, that reprisal of the game. She's doing the treasure hunt around the house. She's engaging with the ghosts. She's taking things upon herself to kind of try and solve this mystery. Was that, uh, how important was that kind of giving her sort of an active role in this film? So it wasn't just spooky events happening to her. Oh, it was, it was clear from the start. I mean, it's like all the, again, and I don't know if it's unconsciously something you pick up from films you loved and hit, that have made a, a huge impact on you. And uh, uh, there's like many different movies that um, that could have influenced the orphanage. But uh, it, it's funny because at, uh, at some point I remember having this discussion with Bayona. I was like trying to, I was trying to articulate 
what was it that I loved the most about horror movies or what started from the movies I, I, I loved. And it was, that was The Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, Alien, and The Shining. And what do all those films have in common? It's all about mothers worrying about their kids. And all of them have even, I mean, probably not alien, but we found out in aliens that yes, he wanted to come home <laughs> to be with her daughter also, but, but she's very active. And it, and, and uh, so it, it's funny how I thought motherhood is a big thing uh, somehow for, I mean, why have, um, a horror movie will affect me. It, um, the Omen was another one, I think. So it's, yeah. and, and and they're all and all those characters had something that was yeah they're they're active in their own stories they're drive they're the force that drives the story forward all the time and I don't know if that was a conscious decision I think it was just like some kind of I don't know unconscious voice in my head speaking at me saying <laughs> trying to make something like the movies I loved the final third is almost a silent film we have the the sort of a uh... You know, one, two, three, knock on the wall. As you mentioned, you know, we've had that in the beginning and it's like a, a sort of sinister reversal, sinister reprisal of that. In, in your first draft, was this ending always as full of restraint, as full of quiet? Yeah, yeah and it's probably um, the part of the script that changed less throughout the whole process. And again, as, as in terms of speaking about rules and stuff. I remember in, in school, they always told us, okay, this is what a page, a script page should look like. There should be a balance between the action and the dialogue. And, and, and those final pages of the script were just description of action with hardly any dialogue at all. Uh, the only thing that they had was that huge monologue that Laura does for her ghost kid in the basement. And and we got some comments about that. It's of course when, when you send something to 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 production company, the, the person who's going to read it first is not the producer; is someone right out of school <laughs> who knows all these rules and wants you to stick <laughs> to them. Uh, but we, I, I thought it was important because that, I mean that's I think that's the that's the part where the movie really flies. That's that's. The, the those are the moments where everything that cinema can give you i mean you're playing with all the tools and that's where the movie takes off i was watching it last night again to to have it fresh in my mind and i had lots of lots of problems with the, the first two acts i was like oh man no this doesn't work oh no this movie hasn't aged well and oh really we which funny and, and this actor and oh no 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 and uh, I'll go into some of them <laughs> later if you want. But sure. the third act grabbed me again. And because that's, uh, it's it's when you pick up everything you've planted throughout the story, comes back uh, and gives you a different angle. And I think the puzzle really fits. Um, and it's also, it's, it's yeah, it's like watching a silent movie. It's it's the, the power of cinema, you know, from sort of like grabbing you without... It's, it's it's not a play. It's not a novel. It's something else that can only be experienced this way. And uh, and I'm really proud of that final act. <laughs> not so much yeah. the other. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it is so sensory. But um, we we then get to sort of this this emotional climax that yeah. simultaneously is so dark. In the, you know, she discovers the truth about what happened to Simone and then she ostensibly commits suicide. But if but but emotionally, there's like a really positive and uplifting in a weird way kind of resolution where, you know, she gets what she wanted in a way. She wanted to sort of become a carer of children who who needed yeah. her and she wanted to be reunited with Simone and she's granted those things. Can you tell me about sort of yeah, how you how you landed on that being the only kind of fitting way to end this story? Oh, well, as I said before, as it's uh, whenever I started the story, the, the only thing that I need to know is how it's going to end. And, uh, and I thought when I had my first idea for the story, that it would be really chilling to, to have to tell the story of this woman who loses her kid uh who's not really her kid 
and wants to go back to reunite with her family. In, in, in the case of the early earliest draft, it was the, Simon and his brothers and sisters. So it's, it's always about reunion with a family that's not possible and a family that's not really a family because the emotional links are created through your, I, I believe, through life, not through what you're giving. And, and play with what, what is real and what you would like reality to be, how, how you, you prefer to stay in a fantasy rather than reality, because reality can, real life can be so cruel and senseless that it's sort of like we create stories to make sense of what happens. You know, it's like, and, and it's the fairy tales and, and she ends up being the main character of her own fairy tale. So there was, again, it was like, I was going to that frontier land <laughs> and it was so interesting mixing all these elements that were opposite and and sort of living, trying to tell a story where you leave the audience in, in, in that mixture of feelings and let them decide what they're watching. But that was really attractive to me. And, uh, and it was the first thing that, that we knew. And probably that's why that third act was, this, was almost stayed as it was in the beginning. It was the other parts earlier on that we changed. And that coda, like we, we don't end on that shot of the, the sort of light coming in from, from the lighthouse and, uh, and Laura kind of reconnecting with Simon. Instead, we have the, the husband mm -hmm. kind of walking through the empty house and sort of uh, looking up and smiling. And there's a sort of sense of a reunion taking place and, and him, as you mentioned earlier, sort of believing for the first time. Can you tell me when, when that kind of entered the process and why it felt like you had to leave on a sort of positive note like that? I'm not sure it's a positive note. And um, <laughs> I, I, I I leave that out to the audience interpretation. I, I think it feels like a positive, not just like Laura's reunion feels positive because there's so wonderful, sweet music playing over it. <laughs> and actually, <laughs> I, I remember when uh, when we went to to record the the score, Fernando Velázquez, the composer, had two versions for that scene because he he told us I'm I'm not really sure if uh, if this is a, a blue moment or a red moment, and he meant with the <laughs> with the light from the light when the lighthouse hits the room, it all sort of gets in sort of a golden color, and when the light goes out, it's it's bluish and cold, and there's that, that game playing. That if you if you had had you play that scene without music it would be something and and with the other music that fernando made suddenly it was it was a tragic scene <laughs> and so again that's the part where the script writer goes away and the director <laughs> decides what he's going to do with the story i thought that uh it, it could have been more that ending was meant to be very ambiguous and also mm -hmm. there's something about Again, speaking of point of view, you experience the whole movie through Laura's eyes. There's not a moment in the story where another character is telling you, oh, you what happens. It's You're always with her. Sometimes you see things that you, she doesn't see, but you're with her all the time. And this is the first time in the movie where, some other, where another character looks at the story from the outside. And so, so in a way, it's almost it's it's the audience who's doing that. It's uh, and and it's something that I I sort of I learned with this picture and I and I've tried to replicate in other movies like in, in Marabon at the end the character of Ali comes back and has a a full different view of what happened but here is like you know, Carlos is meant to be the audience who 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 is now able to watch from the outside and decide what's happened and uh, so okay we have that medal in there the audience has seen. How it got there, Carlos hasn't. He decides to believe, and the audience can decide what they want. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, we we touched on it, but let's let's dive into it. What were the things in the sort of first and second acts that you wish had been done differently? <laughs> <laughs> um, there is one moment in particular that. 
I that got me so right after Benigna gets hit by the truck. Yeah. Um, Carlos runs to help the the woman lying on the floor, and Laura runs <laughs> to the truck screaming, "Simon, Simon!" And I'm like, "What? What? She screamed? I mean, she's not carrying her kid in a baby carriage, clearly." <laughs> and it's something that was it was an ADR that someone put in there for God knows what obnoxious reason, and it really bothers me when I watch that movie because it makes her look stupid. That's one of the things. That, but at the same time, you never know because I, I don't know people. Sometimes audience are or audiences are so invested that they don't even think of what's happening, and they go with it. So I don't know, but it's something that really bothered me, and. Uh, can't remember there was something oh uh those moments where we break the point of view and uh there's something that uh, when she finally realizes where that golden doorknob goes um i'm kind of mad that she pulls the that she peels the paper away <laughs> because i mean the the paper is there, the, the lines in the paper are meant to hide that that's a door. But yeah. I, um, some people found that confusing and thought that someone had wallpaper that room after Simon had gone in there, therefore making it impossible that he then to have that double reading of being having it be something that Simon planned or something that has ghostly intervention. So that kind of bothered me a little bit. But it's it's all the details where the movie goes in a direction where it's like, Yes, there are ghosts where it could have been either or. <laughs> so it's any place that the film interrupts the ambiguity and the interiority of the movie in terms of its its faithfulness to just being from Lara's perspective. That's where it kind of wavers yeah. a bit for you. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. You know, you mentioned something a moment ago and it kind of chimed with this quote that I read about how like, I think it was actually in a, an interview about Marybone rather than The Orphanage, but it kind of spoke to your work and your, and your sort of philosophy as a storyteller as a whole. You said, this is what I'm building a filmography on. It's kind of the reconstruction of pain and how you turn pain into something valuable or how you make sense of things that make no sense and how through fiction you can make life bearable. Whereas the things that happen in the real world make no sense and are way too grim. I just love that quote. And I was hoping you could unpack it for me. And um, yeah, just explain where the orphanage falls into into that that you've you've just described as a philosophy. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's it's difficult for me to do that because it's um, I don't think you're fully aware when you're writing. Of I, I I I've often said that the best moments in screenwriter in screenwriting for me are like sometimes you're on a deadline and nothing good has come out that week and you stay up all night and suddenly at three or four in the morning it's like you enter a trance and you become a, a medium and it the script writes itself it it's coming it's like there's a voice inside of you dictating that story and and those moments are so exciting and incredible that make up for all the other horrible boring moments in the process <laughs> of writing something yeah. and and i don't know where that comes from i have no idea but but yet also it's like another thing i've i've said sometimes it's like i i feel like when when you're a writer it's like you're giving a garden with a hidden treasure and life gives you the tools to dig out that treasure. You don't know what you're going to find, but it's in there and you have an intuition, you know, there's something, again, probably that's one, one reason why Close Encounters is, it's, it's a movie that, that, that I connect so much to because I have no idea what it is about stories dealing with childhood and death that obsess me so much and and I've always written stories about characters trying to go back to a home that no longer exists I don't know why and 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 this thing with death with well, that's what attracted me about the about the impossible also and uh, 
at the time I hadn't lived, I've, I've lived through quite pain, things that were very painful. I, I, I lost a niece to bone cancer uh, around the time when we were making the impossible. And, and I think that quote you read, it's actually something that was in the, in the making of a um, book for the impossible. And I was, I think I was specifically talking about my loss and how I tried when Maria, the, the woman whose like, who story we're telling the story, told us her story. I was trying to make that story about everyone who'd lost someone and in a way connect to, to me. And that's where, it, where that came from. It's like, in, life can be, I, I think we, uh, we spoke about this before. It's like, life is, makes no sense. It's, it's cruel and it's awful. And, and yet it's full of love and all around. And, and, you, and storytelling gives you the chance to make sense of all these things or try to give meaning to things that don't have any meaning. Uh, what for? I, said, um, I don't know. I, give, I guess to sort of like uh, let other people know out there, who, people who have gone through the same things you've gone through, that they're not alone. That's the only sense they can make. You can think of, I don't know, uh, maybe if you watch the films I make, you might think that I have a strong belief in the, in, in uh, life after death. I don't. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm not sure at all, but it's like, but I'd like to. I, I don't know. I, I guess that's the reason why I find ghost stories comforting because I've been uh, way too close to death way too soon. I don't know. Mm. But true to that quote, you know, um, did you find in the aftermath of the orphanage, which really did strike such a chord, it had one of the biggest openings ever in, in Spain, I believe, like, did you find yourself kind of uh, meeting people who had suffered loss, they had gone through grief, and in this film, they found like an arena to process some of their thoughts about it? Did you kind of encounter people who were grateful for the orphanage and it's kind of... Yes. I suppose, yeah. Many. And actually, it was it was really surprising when we did the, the press tour in the U.S. Um, there was a surprising number of journalists who came to us and, and shared personal stories of loss, and because the the film had touched them deeply, and and sort of had, they had found comfort in this. And, and you know, no movie is for everybody. I, I, I always say that films are like a radio signal. There's like, you send it out and depending on your frequency, you will get it or you won't. <laughs> It'll speak to you or, or it won't at all. So some people may think this movie is a silly ghost story. And for some others, it can be something highly emotional but it was a uh, it was it was strange because we found it's it also almost reminds me of that moment in the film where um lara goes into the the grieving group and she she speaks about ghosts thinking that they're gonna think she's crazy and what happens is that everyone in that room has had an experience uh it's like okay they all have seen ghosts even though now they've put them, they're at peace, so they're, they're putting them in, in logical, reasonable places. She's still not there yet. But it's surprising how many people, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who, who have suffered and, and believe or want to believe. And it's happened in the 15 years since the movie. It's happened many, many times. Only last week, suddenly, I, I, I met this woman who was like had no idea who i was and we were talking blah blah so you make movies and and what movies do you make and it's like the orphanage and suddenly she goes very pale and <laughs> she rolls up her sleeve and she shows me she had actually tattooed on her arm seeing is not believing is the other way around and wow. and she told me a story that I, I i will not share because it would be betraying but it, she told yeah. me why that that moment had meant so much to her so yeah you, you you make films and you i think what you have to do is whenever you make something make it deeply personal make it be important for you and you it's like you you put a message in a bottle and you throw it out in the ocean and somebody somewhere will get it <laughs> it might be meaningful to them and in terms of the other sort of fallout of the movie, 
there was some talk for a while about a, a, a remake, a US remake that yeah. Amy Adams, I think, was attached to. And there was some talk that you had done a pass of the script or something like that. What Whatever happened with that? And how grateful were you that it that it didn't come to pass? Because that was a strange kind of time, the, the sort of US remakes of foreign films based on the predication that people won't want to watch movies in other languages. Yeah, um, actually, I, I never got to make a pass at, at, at the script. Um, and, and even it was at the moment, I, I again, because there were things that we thought we could have done better. I didn't think it was such a bad idea at the time. And only recently, it's like they came back to me and they asked me if I would want to, to, to direct the remake. And I thought, no, that's that's done. You know, that 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 movie had its purpose, and 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 that's it. But no, I didn't. I didn't get to write it because um, actually Guillermo wanted me to write it, but it was uh, at a time when they, there was a, a writer strike. Uh, I think it was two thousand and eight or something like that. Yeah, and I, yeah. And I was shooting a made for television movie at the time, which was the first time I direct I directed something uh a feature and uh and he called me he's like can you make a pad can you can you write it and i was like i'm gonna be busy for the next six months and he told me mm, there's gonna be a strike we need to do it mm, before and so i couldn't and i i i i never i i read something <laughs> later on <laughs> it, it was pretty similar to there the, the weren't many big changes uh but no it's like I, in at the time, I think it was, I don't know, because when you see Let the Right One In and Let Me In, I think mm -hmm. um, they're both good movies. So yeah. there is a universe somewhere out there with a remake of The Orphanage that is probably very good. But <laughs> right now, I don't miss it. I think, thankfully, we have many other stories to tell and we can move on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, I mean, I loved The Impossible and I loved Marabone, which was, that was your director, feature directorial debut, right? That was, yeah, um, yeah really special. In terms I of the future. It. Not many people liked it. <laughs> oh, really? I loved it. I oh, mean, sorry. that cast not, for a start, that, like, you know. I mean, many people liked it, but there were also many people that disliked it strongly <laughs> because it was, it was a very hard bet. <laughs> and I'm so proud of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so you should be um but yeah can you tell me like i mean sergio this has been so much fun kind of revisiting this this film that's celebrating its 15th anniversary somehow don't know where the time's gone celebrating its 15th anniversary this year in terms of the future for you you know now that you are directing your own stories as well as kind of writing them you know where would you love to go from now is there anything you can tell me about the projects you're working on and um yeah sort of your, your aspirations for the future well i just finished uh, a series for Netflix. Uh, it's called Alma in Spanish, and I think the English title is going to be "Girl in the Mirror" again. <laughs> so mirrors. mirrors everywhere. Uh, it's a different kind of mirror. Don't worry. You know? <laughs> uh, but this movie also deals with 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 loss and and grieving and memory and family. I think with uh, with this one, I I sort of. Mm, I'm closing some kind of cycle where it's like, okay, I feel like I already s said everything I needed to say about these things. And I'm moving on to do something that, well, there's probably going to be a season two and three of, of Girl in the Mirror. Um, and also I'm, I'm preparing another series, which is going to be a family. It's going to be a comedy with, with time and trouble and dealing with family again. And then at some point I would like to do a horror movie because in, in, in my mind, I, I have not yet done a horror film. I would not call The Orphanage <laughs> or Marijuana horror movies. Uh, they're, they're frontier films. And I would like to cross the frontier and go and do a full on horror <laughs> where you don't all these restrictions and all these things so that way you sort of had to hold yourself and contain. I would like to do something that's like explosive and then, have it have be a really terrifying experience, but we'll see if that, you know, I am probably next year, hopefully when Belen comes back from um, Bayona shoot. Awesome. Well, I look forward to it. And uh, yeah, as I say, man, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for taking time out today, Sergio. It's been so Thank fantastic you. hearing hearing about this film. Thank you, Al. It's been a pleasure.
You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <laughs>